you to purchase. They're only four bucks. There's several of them in the back. There's a place there to pay for them. If you don't have the money, go ahead and take one. But uh, when you take one, let Chris know, and he'll pay for it for you, okay? <laughs> so, uh, How to Find God, New Testament, Living Water for Those Who Thirst. Has some great information in the very beginning about the plan of salvation, things you ought to, uh, uh, just some little doctrinal statements, uh, uh, explanation of doctrinal words, New Living Translation, easy to understand, and uh, just a great tool to share in witnessing. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is have one for yourself, but be prepared to give it away. If you're sharing with someone and they need something, just give it to them, okay? And, uh, or have a couple of them, and, uh, uh, because it, it helps. You know, uh, you remember Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that God said his word would not return void. It'll not be empty. It'll not be futile. God will use his word as it pleases him. It tells us in the verse there. So anytime you give away to the word of God, you're planting seed to help others. And so I encourage you, uh, pick up one, pick up two, and uh, they're uh, very inexpensive. And so uh, now the, the money, we're not making any money on them, but we're replenishing. We want to just keep that back there as a resource. And uh, Matthew chapter 11 We're looking at some very, uh, just a, a short passage today. We're going to read verse 25 through 30, but we're going to primarily look at verses 28 through 30. And uh, I would really encourage you to take notes and to pay close attention to this because God not only has a message for you uh, in this passage, but he's also going to give you some valuable scriptural information for you to share with others. And a very simple outline. Uh, you have an invitation from God here. I'm playing on that theme, the Lord's invitation. You also see some commandments in there, some promises. You could even say these are promises, our commandments, our invitations from God. Just three simple ones. The invitation to come, the invitation to take, the invitation to learn. You could also put on there uh, for the three points, you could say salvation, submission, or sanctification. And uh, if you wanted to look at it from that perspective, and you'll see as I give explanation how that opens up. Now, you know as well as I do that we live in a difficult time. I've mentioned that in the introduction there on your paper, on your, your, your sermon notes. Uh, we live in just a difficult, challenging time. And uh, anyone who uh, is aware of society and culture today, they realize that. Just over the past two weeks, Supreme Court has passed down uh, some interesting uh, decisions. And boy, you're talking about division I read someone posted, they said, uh, uh, you know, today they're disagreeing, protesting, and uh, responding in such a negative way. Last month, they didn't even know what a woman was. And uh, <clears throat> so we live in interesting times. We, we, we live in a topsy-turvy world where everything is sort of upside down. Right is wrong, wrong is right, and uh, we just re live in a... We live in a very humanistic, you want the definition of a humanism, just go back and read Genesis 3. That's humanism, where Satan convinced Eve that uh, uh, you can be as God, you can think, you can know, and uh, that's what humanism is. Uh, man's his own God. And uh, so we see the, the just this challenging time in which we live, uh, uh, we live in a time where socialism is becoming so popular. And, uh, you know, socialism in a nutshell is just uh, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. I mean, that's, that's just, and, and so, so we live in this time. Uh, Gallup just had a poll that came out recently. Maybe you, uh, you read something about that. And they did a poll on religion, as they do. 
and, uh, and on, on belief in God. And in the past, past several years, every year, uh, the, the number who believe in God goes down. And so we have less people believing in God today. Many of us grew up in, a, in an era where, uh, you know, whether you respected God, you at least believed in him. And you did respect the church. Today, we, uh, uh, Tom has had to send out information to, uh, to warn us that we need to protect the church today because uh, even having a service, we, we're in danger of, 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 of people who are in disagreement with us. And we just live in such a, a different society today. And just when so many things are going on to upset society, and there's so much division in society today. But you know, I, I believe the scripture has the answer uh, to all of our problems. And by the way, in that Gallup poll, those who, uh, who did not believe in God uh, was strongly from uh, the liberal element of society, those who claim to be liberals, and, and the younger generation. Do you hear me? The younger generation. That's on us, church. <clears throat> Are we not teaching our children doctrine? Are we not passing along the scriptures to our young people today? That's why Sunday school is important for your kids. That's why Bible study, uh, morning Bible study is important to you. If you don't know what you believe and you don't know how to explain it, how are you going to pass it on to your children? So we live in a challenging time, and, and sometimes uh, the reason we're in these times is the church does not rise up to the challenge before us. And if we're not going to take up that challenge, who is? We have the answer to, to society's problems, do we not? Jesus is the answer. We have the solution. Jesus is the solution to people's problems. Now we look at a very practical portion of Scripture here today. And I trust that you will uh, listen very carefully. And listen, jot down some notes and jot down some cross-references and make sure you look at these later because this will help you. It'll not only help you, it'll give you <clears throat> some, some, some valid, credible, biblical information uh, to pass on to others because we, we, we live in a society that, even in the Christian world, uh, we struggle so much with, with hurts and hang-ups. And there's so much baggage. And uh, you'll notice the central idea, surrender to Christ's loving yoke. And you will experience his perfect rest. Now, we'll explain what we mean by rest there, because you see that a couple times in the text. But the challenge is the word surrender. Surrender to the Lord's loving yoke. And we'll explain what that means, that word yoke. And you'll experience his perfect rest. Sometimes we want perfect rest. We want perfect answers, we want solutions, we want things to work out according to how we want them, but we don't want to surrender and pay the price to get to that place. And it requires a submission on our part. And so often we're not willing to use our mind and our heart to open up. It's easy to say, well, uh, you know, I, I just I can't get rid of these thoughts in my mind. Sure you can. Sure you can. The reason you can't get rid of them is you choose not to. You say, well, that's pretty simple. I, I know it sounds pretty simple, but, uh, and, and I realize that there are some situations uh, that, are, that are stronger and, and more difficult than others, but I'm just trying to be practical with you from the Word of God. You have to start with Jesus, and you have to start with His Word. So I ask you the question, are you experiencing His rest? Now, I'm going to spend more time on this later, but the word rest there is not talking about rest and relaxation. It's talking about rest as far as, uh, 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 just for an example, you go on vacation. And uh, you might plan a vacation that's, that's really a, a busy time. My son-in-law and daughter just celebrated their 22nd wedding anniversary, and they went away for a night and and uh, spent the night uh, with dinner and everything, and the, but the next day they went on a hike. You say, well, that doesn't sound very relaxing. It is if you enjoy doing that. You see, rest 
involves activity, but it involves activity that you enjoy doing. Sometimes we go on vacation and we do a lot of activity stuff, but it's something we enjoy doing. Now look at the passage with me. We begin in verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. <clears throat> now, if you're in Christ, you might be a babe in Christ, but you, if you're born again, you can understand things that unsaved people cannot understand. <clears throat> and keep in mind, he's dealing here, he's dealing here with, with, with the religious leaders who have been rebellious, and in the context of that chapter, they've rebelled against John and Jesus. And so, he says, you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So you have the sovereignty of God there, especially in verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So you have the sovereignty of God there. But then he comes back with the balance of human responsibility when he begins verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. So we're going to summarize with these three promises, these three invitations. Jesus is always inviting us to come. 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 Got a little music background for the pastor there. I was in an African-American church once for a funeral, and the organist liked to play the organ while the pastor was preaching. Boy, the pastor did a high note in the organ. Anybody ever experienced that? And the pastor would preach, and boy, that organ, that organist was there the whole time. That's uh, just a side note. I'm sorry to get distracted here. I get distracted easily. Uh, so we see here that, that we have here an explanation of Christianity that is radically different from every other religious system in the history of the world. And we need to keep in mind, don't be afraid of the word radical when it comes to Christianity. And, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, boy, that is a radical sermon from the Lord Jesus. But man, it is a sermon that will build you spiritually and strengthen you in your faith. And so we see here this emphasis. And, and, and let's, let, let's just, uh, as, you, as you consider verses 28 through 30 there, and you look at the application there, Jesus was speaking to these self-righteous, legalistic, judgmental people who were burdened down with, with laws and rules and regulations and commandments. And we need to make sure that we don't build our church on just rules and regulations. New people come into the church and they don't know who's making up the rules. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know, you know, uh, that's why we want to stay with the scriptures, right? Right? Thus saith the Lord. And so we see here that, that what they were dealing with. And so in Matthew, uh, you find Jesus dealing and wrestling with these religious leaders. And, uh, and, and so that leads us in to the very first invitation he, and the invitation to come there in verse 28. Now, he's going to teach us there that, that true salvation is in a person, and he's also going to teach us in that section, secondly, that to come to him means to trust him. And he's also going to remind us that we are imperfect, sinful people. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that you have reached sinless perfection. We are still sinners. Our sins are under the blood of Christ, but we need to... To, to, to walk with the Lord, and you can see how in that first invitation, he's dealing with salvation, and he's reminding us there of salvation. And in contrast to these scribes and Pharisees, Jesus called the weary and the burden 
to come to him. Now, that's true Christianity explained. And the message of Jesus to all of us is always come. Come to me. Come to me. Uh, you, 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 feel, you, you feel burdened today. You feel weary. You feel discouraged. You feel despondent. Uh, despondent, despondent. You, you, you feel depressed. You feel, uh, uh, you know, Jesus says to all of us, come. Come to me. If, you, if you're heavy burdened and you're just, you're, you're, and, and, and the weight of it is down on you, come to me. All of us need to come to Jesus' experience originally for salvation, but we need that throughout our spiritual growth also. And so he's reminding us of that. Jesus called the weary and the burden to come to him, and, uh, you know, and, and because he wants us to give him the full weight of all of our sin, and even as Christians, our struggles and our sins and our problems, Jesus wants us to dump those things on him. You say, well, that's hard to do. I've tried to dump them on him, but he doesn't seem to take them. No, uh, he, he says here he'll take them. So there's something wrong with your dumping process. You see, sometimes we say, well, I, I want to dump this on the Lord. I want to cast this on him. I want to give this to him. But then we hang on to it. And that's why you've got to fight and, 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 and take control of the, the mind away from Satan because he wants to use your brain as a little playpen. And so we see here the importance of what he's teaching us. And uh, see, see, these people were so burdened because they had failed over and over again to keep the law, and the leaders kept pouring more laws on them. And Jesus said, no, come to me. Come to me. Do you see how personal that is? Let me help you. So you see the importance there of your, your sub-point there. True salvation is in a person. See, the Pharisees... Uh, what, what did the Pharisees always say? Do. Do this. Do that. Work. Work your way. And most false cults and religions today is a do religion. It's a work religion. Whereas in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you see, they, they wanted people to, to keep following Moses and traditions. But true salvation is found only in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's saying to you, there's nothing on this, in this world that you can do to, to earn this. Boy, isn't that the sovereignty? Isn't that the wisdom? Isn't that the omniscience of God to, to have a plan like that? You say, what do I have to do? Come. Come just as you are. See, some people say, well, you know, I'm not ready to make a commitment to the Lord. I've got things I need to. No, come as you are. Let him help you clean up the things. You've got to trust him. You've got to, uh, to, to come to him. And, and then to come also means to trust him. To come to him means to trust him. You see, this invitation is open to those who are exhausted and those who are burdened down. And this is exactly how the people felt under the yoke of Pharisaical legalism and you find that over and over in the gospels jesus didn't get as, uh, exasperated with uh, with true believers and with christians and even with sinners i love the story of zacchaeus you like that story where is it is it luke 11 uh but uh anyhow uh, he he said come down from that tree zacchaeus zacchaeus didn't even know jesus knew who he was i'm going to your house tonight and Zacchaeus invites all the sinners and all the tax collectors to come in. And what did they uh, 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 accuse Jesus of all the time? Oh, he, he, he eats with sinners. He, he, he's a glutton, and, and, and he just hangs out with those. Hangs out with those people. We're all those people. And uh, he says, come to me. Isn't that a great thought? Isn't that a great invitation? We're imperfect and sinful people. And uh, that's why we need the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he reminds us over and over again, come to me. You see, Jesus gives all he has to us. And that's why in salvation, he wants us to give ourselves back to him. Remember, as you hear Jesus' invitation, that he's the stronger one. 
He's the one that has the strength here. He's the one that has the ability to help you. The one who alone is able to bear the weight of the commands given in the scriptures and from the Heavenly Father. This is the one who invites you into this yoke with him. We give to him the full weight of all our sin. He gives us a full pardon of our sin. See, he wants all your sins dumped on him. He will pardon you if you're sincere about that. What's the second invitation? He says, invitation, uh, I, I, I make this invitation to come. This is salvation. Come to me. But there's also the invitation to take. I want you to take something. Look at, the, look at verse 29. Take my yoke. Boy, that's an interesting concept. Take my yoke up on you and learn from me. Now, you come to Christ by faith. You see that in one under there? You come to Christ by faith. What, what is faith? Faith is to trust in something. It's to believe in something. Now, if your faith is wavering, it's, it means that you're not willing to fully trust the Lord. You remember in Ephesians 4, he says, you know, they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're bounced back and forth because we're listening at the wrong voices. That's why we need to be in the Word of God. Come to Christ by faith. Take my yoke. Now, that phrase, take my yoke, means to become a disciple. Take my yoke means to become a disciple. Uh, I had an interesting explanation I wanted to share with you on that, on that yoke. Uh, guy that pastors the uh, McLean Bible Church, uh, he was in charge of missions for NAM at one time, uh, and uh, I should have written his name down here, but he, he said to begin with, it means we give all we have to Jesus. The imagery is this passage is of a yoke. A yoke was a heavy wooden bar that fits over the neck of an ox so that it can pull a cart or a plow. The yoke could be put on one animal or could be shared between two animals. In a shared yoke, one of the oxen would often be much stronger than the other. The stronger ox was more schooled in the commands of the master, and so it would guide the other according to the master's plans, uh, commands. By coming into the yoke with the stronger ox, the weaker ox could learn to obey the master's voice. That was uh, in a commentary. And, uh, and so he gives us the explanation, take my yoke means to become a disciple, a follower of the Lord. Now, we understand that in, in very simple ways. Like I could say, I want to move this communion table here, and I could try to move it myself. Boy, that thing is heavy. But if I asked Bart to come up here and get to hold the other end, we could move it together. And so when we, we, we talk about take my yoke, we're talking about working together on something. Now, my wife is a good driver. I'm not going to confess all my sin here. She's a very, she's a very patient driver. One of my sons got in a little difficulty years ago, and, and he, he wasn't a reckless driver. He was just careless. He was a daydreamer, and he finally got enough tickets to, we got a little letter in the mail and said, you, you need to remove this one from your insurance or else we're going to drop your insurance. So he had to get his own insurance. So, uh, and he said, Dad, I'm going to start driving just like Mom. Now, my wife, as, as, as we've gotten, you know, matured in life, chronologically speaking, trying to be diplomatic here, uh, she doesn't like to drive at night. She doesn't like to drive in rain. If we're, if we're on a long drive, she likes for me to drive. Now, when I take over the wheel, she starts singing, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> but the driver doesn't always listen to Jesus, take the wheel. 
I'm trying to do better. If there were a break on the passenger side, I'd have whiplash all the time. And so we, we, we see here, but we, we work together, right? And you see this, Jesus is saying, now look at that verse again, take my yoke, my yoke. Take my yoke up on you and learn from me. Take my yoke. You look down in verse 30, for my yoke is easy. Now you see that that word easy means well-fitting. My yoke is well-fitting and my burden is what? What? Are you looking at the scripture? Well-fitting. I, I, I like the New Living Translation there. It reads like this. It says, for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. My yoke is easy to bear. Now, he's not saying there that we go through difficult times. Listen, I'm not overlooking the fact that we go through challenges. We go through emotional experiences. We go through times of struggle. But I am simply saying, don't let Satan get the victory when you're going through those things. Because the invitation is to come, and the invitation is to take. Take my yoke up on you. Let Jesus come along beside of you. Let him take the will of your life. Let him come along. And then there's the invitation to learn. Verse 29. And uh, learn from me. Now, you never stop learning. Now, you remember in the beginning I mentioned that that first point, the invitation to come is salvation and spiritual growth. That second point, the invitation to take, is submission. You see in this third point, sanctification. Now, sanctification is just a long word. In the Greek and Hebrew original language, it just means to set apart. It means to make holy. So he's saying that when we, be, we come to Jesus as a child of God, when we're born again, we become a Christian, he wants to make us holy holy for two reasons he wants us to be holy in him and then he wants us to keep learning when he sets us apart as a disciple of Christ we become the word disciple means a learner a student don't be intimidated by discipleship say well I'm a Christian but I I, I, I can't handle that discipleship stuff well if you're going to learn if you're going to grow if you're going to let him teach you, and I, I'm sorry, but none of us are at the place to where we've got it all together, right? Man, I've been at this a long time. I'm still growing and learning. About the time I think I know something, like the guy that said, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. We're growing. We're learning in the Lord. So, so we see this invitation to learn, to grow. Now, you remember some of you who are country western singers, Winona and Naomi. They did that song, uh, Grandpa, Tell Us About the Good Old Times. Grandpa, tell us about the good old times. But I got news for you. Those old times were not always that good. Right? We've got to keep growing up in the Lord. We've got to keep, listen, be a learner, be a grower, stretch your mind. You say, oh, I, there's so much in the scripture. Oh, just take it a day at a time, a week at a time, a month at a time. Study personally. Come to our Sunday morning Bible study. Two great studies for adults Sunday morning, Sunday school for the kids. Get in the word Wednesday night. Study together, grow together, learn. We're, we're learning, we're growing. And so we see this invitation to learn. Now, learning is a process. And these first two commands, they, they represent a crisis as we come and yield to Christ. But this step, this learning step is a process. You're not going to get... You're not going to get saved, get born again the same day and be fully sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit and, and just got it all together. It's a process. 
It's a growing process. Just like you like to see, I, I, I got two grandsons that live locally. They both had basketball games yesterday, and Barb and I just marveling at how they're growing and how strong they're getting. And just, uh, but, but it's great to see, physically speaking, that they're growing, and mentally speaking, they're learning, and they're, and well, he's saying here, spiritually speaking, I want you to be growing. I want you to be learning. It, stay involved in this process. Learning leads to a deeper peace. Notice what he says there. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I'm going to close with that emphasis. And you will find rest for your souls. Now, he's not talking about, you say, boy, I need to rest. I just need a nap. He's not talking about that. He's talking about being in that place where there might be activity, but it's, something, it's activity that's good for you that you want to be involved in. My kids, they're all uh, 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 bike riders, and they're all hikers. And, and uh, 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 my, uh, one of my sons on Father's Day took his two boys to Roanoke and the Appalachian Trail, and they went on a, on a big hike there. You think, wow. Now, me, I'm not interested in going to the Appalachian Trail and hiking. But to him, that was relaxing. That was activity. That was, and that's what he's saying here. To you and me. As we learn about him, we find this deeper peace. Now listen, let me just share something with you real quick here. And just write these scriptures down. The first peace that we strive for is Romans 5, 5, 1. And I, I, I love this verse, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Therefore, having been justified, having been saved, having come to him for salvation, bringing our sin and having that sin forgiven, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You wonder why this world is so, uh, so divisive, why they have no peace, because they don't have Jesus. Now, we need to guard against becoming divisive, and, and we're not in competition with one another. We're in this battle together, amen? We want to yoke together. And so we see that, we see the difference there in, in peace with God. Peace with God starts at salvation. Now, second is the peace of God. And you find this in Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Listen, you ought to live in Philippians 4. You ought to spend some time in there, especially verses 6 through 8. I like even verse 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will say rejoice. In other words, be full of joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Be full of joy. Boy, there's no place in this world for some grumpy Christian. Look like they took a swig of pickle juice before they came to church. And, and uh, so he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness or your graciousness be known by all men, the Lord is at hand. The Lord's near. He wants gracious Christians. He wants us to show Jesus. And listen to this. Be anxious for nothing. That literally means don't worry about anything. Why pray when you can worry, right? Why worry when you can pray? Because he's promised that you have access to him. He wants you to cast your burdens on him. Just like the garbage truck picks up the trash and dumps it in that large. That, that's exactly what he wants you. That's what that word cast means. Throw that garbage up on the truck. Get rid of it. Give it to Jesus. He goes on to say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. 
Let your request be, known, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses or passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, how we need our hearts and minds guarded. If something's going on in that brain and then that mind, you can't get, uh, listen, you need to turn that over to the Lord. Uh, what gets in there is what you allow to get in there. Now, let me just close out by sharing those last thoughts with you quickly. We see that learning leads to deeper peace. We see that learning, again, means to make disciples. And he reminds us of that. Now, look with me in the conclusion there. He says, number one, several responses we need to give in this invitation. Repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. Listen, don't let your sins build up. You've been unfaithful. You had the wrong thoughts. You've been looking at the wrong things on television. Men, you've been looking at some porn. Uh, you know, whatever's going on in your life, you've been unfaithful to God in some way. Repent. Confess your sins, and I'm faithful and just to forgive you immediately of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So foremost, repent of your sins. Don't be indifferent. Don't be unrepentant when you become aware of your disobedience, but instead confess and then run from it. Don't feed that weakness. Secondly, renounce yourself. Like a child, come to the Father and throw aside your pride. You know, most of us wrestle with so much pride. That's why I'm going to close with these words that he mentioned to us earlier. But renounce yourself. Get rid of your pride. Humble yourself before the Lord. You know what's going on. You know your weaknesses. Confess them. And then lastly, rest in Christ. Come to the one who is gentle and lowly in heart and find rest for your soul. And when you come to Christ, rejoice forever in him. That's the rest that he offers. Let me close by just reading a, a quote from you. Barb and I have been, uh, been reading a little book, and we listen to it on audio every day and, uh, while we're eating, and, and then we've been uh, keeping it handy to look at. It's a book called uh, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. It's a great little book. It's written by a guy named uh, Dane Ortlung, O-R-T-L-U-N-D. O -R -T -L -U -N -D. Gentle and lowly. And you'll notice he said that to us there in verse 29. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. And let me just read a couple of excerpts. Now listen to this very quickly. Uh, very, very uh, quietly. Listen to, listen, just listen to this part and then we'll be finished. Listen to what Ortlung says. In the one place in the Bible where the Son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer way down in the core of who he is, we are not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We're not told that he is exalted and dignified in heart. We're not even told that he is joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, the surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly. That means he's gentle and humble. He's full of compassion. One thing you get straight right from the start is that when the Bible speaks of the heart, whether Old Testament or New Testament, it's not speaking of our emotional life only, but for the central antimating center of all we do. It is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what we daydream about as we drift off to sleep. It is our motivation headquarters. The heart, in biblical terms, is not part of who we are, but the center of, center of who we are. Our heart is what defines and directs us. That is why Solomon tells us in Proverbs 4.23, keep the heart with all vigilance, for from it, from it flows the springs of life. He goes on to say, uh, the Greek word translated gentle here recurs to just three other times in the New Testament. In the first beatitude, referring to the meek who will inherit the earth, and a prophecy in Matthew 21.5, and that Jesus the King 
is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey. And lowly, the meaning of the word lowly, overlaps with that of gentle, together communicating a single reality about Jesus' heart. This specific word lowly is generally translated humble in the New Testament. Now listen to just a couple more paragraphs and we'll be finished. Listen to this carefully. The point in saying that Jesus is lowly is that he is accessible. For all his replendant joy and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. No prerequisites, no hoops to jump through. Warfield, commenting on 1129 of Matthew, wrote, No impression was left by his life manifestation more deeply imprinted upon the consciousness of his followers than that of the noble humility of his bearing. The minimum bar to be enfolded from the embrace of Jesus is simply open yourself up to him. It is all he needs. Indeed, it is the only thing he works with. Verse 28 of our passage tells us explicitly what qualifies for fellowship with Jesus, all who labor and are heavy laden. You don't need to unburden or collect yourself and then come to Jesus. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. No payment is required. He says, I will give you rest. His rest is gift, not transaction. Whether you're actively working hard to crowbar your life into smoothness, labor, or passively finding yourself weighted down by something outside your control, heavy laden, Jesus Christ's desire that you find rest, that you come uh, in out of the storm, outstrips even your own, gentle and lowly. This, according to his own testimony, is Christ's very heart. That is who he is, tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, willing. If you are asked to, stay only, uh, to say only one thing about who Jesus is, we would be honoring Jesus' own teaching if we answer, he is gentle and lowly. If Jesus hosted his own personal website, the most prominent line of the about me drop down would read, gentle and lowly in heart. Surrender to Christ's loving yoke, and you will experience his perfect rest. Have you surrendered? Have you come? Have you surrendered? Are you learning of him? Now I know that all of us have baggage. We have situations. We have things going on. We have difference of opinion. We have divisive issues. We have, we, we have uh, habits we have things that have been building up for years. We have mental anguish. We have, we have grief. We have, we, we have a, numerous things, and it's, it's, it's different for all of us. We have burdens. But Jesus said, come. Give it to me. Are you willing to give it to him? Now, what's on your mind? What's, what's really bothering you right now? What's on your brain? What's in your heart that's really burdened you, that really, you're really struggling with, that's really got you down? Are you willing right now to say, Jesus, I'm going to let you take the will of my life. I'm going to surrender to you because I want to be a learner. I want you to teach me so that I will become everything you want me to be. What are you struggling with? Jesus has compassion for what you're dealing with. He's waiting for you with open arms. Would you come? Let's pray. Let's all stand as we pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the blessings of your truth. We thank you for your love for us today. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, how precious it is, how powerful it is. 
how strengthening it is, how encouraging it is. And I pray today as we, each of us as we leave that we will ponder this portion of Scripture and that just as you have invited us to come and to take of you and to continue to grow and learn so that we might be everything you want us to be. I pray that you'll help us with that. I pray that there be someone here who doesn't know you as personal Savior, that this morning they will start with that place. And even as I pray, that they will say, Lord, I am a sinner. I want to be saved. I want to spend eternity in heaven. Please forgive me of my sin. And by faith, I trust you in that. If you prayed that prayer, please share it with me later so that I can help you to continue to grow. Whatever you're struggling with and dealing with in your heart and in your mind, let me ask you right now, turn that over to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me to get victory over this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close.